Uh, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, this is the Detroit DT12 conference call. Uh, the objective of, the, of this is to uh, help educate a little bit more on the, uh, the inner workings of the DT12 and uh, help maximize the investment. Uh, we're joined here with all of the Team Run Smart Pros and a couple of representatives from Detroit. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over and have them introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Hello, I'm Henry Albert. I've been driving a DT-12 for over 800,000 miles now. And Ooh. Wayne Steffen, technical sales representative for the Western region. Jerry Freeman, Detroit Diesel Component Sales National Accounts. Jeff Clark, uh, TRS Pro, with over 300,000 miles on a DT-12. Jimmy Navarez, Team Run Smart Pro with one year of local driving, uh, regional driving on the DT-12. It's Joey Slaughter. I've got about 100,000 miles with the uh, DT-12. So let's start by uh, going over the biggest thing that I think helps most people is to understand this transmission is not an automatic. It's an automated manual. And uh, most of the time when people get a bad response out of it, it's because they're using too much throttle towards the beginning of their takeoff. It responds very well to progressively throttling it. Uh, what I use as a gauge is that typically I don't like to hit full throttle till the transmission gets to seventh gear, which is much like if you're driving a 10 speed, you usually don't start putting full throttle down till you hit sixth gear, which is the first gear on the top side of the gearbox. Uh, understanding that if you're in a manual, if you floor the throttle in the lower gears, you'll tend to over rev every gear, and it's even more critical today with the DD15s and DD13s because they respond much quicker than they did in the past. Used to be when you hit the throttle, it was 3.3 seconds before they hit maximum torque. Today, it's 1.5 seconds, making it much easier to over rev a gear if you're too judicious with the throttle in the lower gears. The uh, other part we'd like to start out with is, is explaining them where the clutch pedal is, that it indeed still has a clutch pedal. And um, every time you let off the brake pedal, you're engaging the clutch. Uh, take some practice out in the open. Don't do it in a tight location first. But if you move the brake pedal back and forth real gently, you can actually work it just like a clutch pedal. Know that when you're sitting at a traffic light, every time that you let off the brake, you're engaging the clutch. It's important to know because every time that the clutch engages is one less time it gets to engage in its life. So try to avoid prematurely wearing out the clutch. Um, also keep in mind we will open this up for questions at the end. Um, by progressively throttling the truck, you will maximize its skip shifting. And um, it decides it shifts off of several factors and it really you're communicating with the truck in a different manner instead of manually grabbing everything. So if you start out on a downhill, uh, this happened to me at 72,000 pounds in this case, it wanted to take off in fifth gear. I eased into the throttle and because it knew we were going downhill, it went from fifth, the center of the light it jumped to seventh, on the other side of the intersection it already hit ninth and we were moving right on down the road. Had I floored the throttle at that point, it would have over-revved the first gear that it started out in and would have jumped around and did a remarkably good job of driving, shifting, even though it's not the way that it should be done to maximize it. Um, maximizing ECOS can be done in several ways. Once if you're on the foot throttle, any time that you're below 35 mile an hour, it stopped stops e-coasting because usually you're slowing down to go into town and you don't want to pick up speed at that point. You can maximize the e-coast time with the CC band switch by if you're in rolling hills and you cut it to the wide open position. Actually I did an interesting experiment with that running 55 mile an hour in a 65 for a six hour period and I actually, because of e-coast, was able to average 58 mile an hour with the cruise control set at 55. 
So you really need to look at cruise control in a different way. It's the maximum speed you're willing to fuel the truck to, not the maximum speed you're willing to roll. Um, the big key to understand is this transmission is neither smart nor stupid. It's making all of its decisions off of pure logic. Everything is it's giving you a response to the message, whether it's where you have the CC band switch set, whether it's the kind of terrain that you're on today with the GPS that it reads out with the IPM, with the amount of load factor it has behind it, and it has a tilt switch, and where you put your throttle. So it's much like anything else that's computerized. If you put junk in, you're going to get junk out. If you uh, come up to a traffic light, for example, where, where it shows that it's really a manual, if you come into a light kind of on the hot side and the light changes real quick on you and you apply the throttle and it hesitates, that's because it's doing the same thing you would have done in a manual. It's looking for a gear. Let your foot off the throttle, watch till you see it select a gear, then reapply the throttle in a gentle manner. If you keep your foot buried into the throttle when it's not responding, when it finds a gear, the next thing that's going to happen is it's going to jerk because you as the driver had just gave it instructions to jerk. Um, the, about the only time that I end up using manual mode is if I get on a hill that one gear is too high and one gear is too low and it decides to start hunting back and forth. I will use manual mode in that. As it turns out, very seldom do I use manual mode. Um, it's, it's good to exploit the CC band switch and to understand how it works. It lets it, in the lowest position, it lets it coast three mile an hour over your cruise speed. Two mile an hour beyond that, it puts on the jake. That's important to know that when we talk about the scent control because there's two ways to do it. The middle position is six over with an additional three mile an hour beyond that, then it puts it back in gear. And if that doesn't hold it back, it puts on the jakes. And if that isn't enough, it'll downshift with the jakes on. How you can use this when you're descending a hill is two different ways. You can either put your jake in any position, get your speed to where you want it to be, let your foot off the brake, set your cruise, and it's like setting the cruise control on your brake. That's, that's considered descent control. Uh, you can find a video of that on YouTube if you look up Detroit DT-12 descent control. The other way that I find is much simpler to do that is to have your band switch in the tightest position. And when you're going downhill, click your decel of your cruise control to 5 mile an hour under the speed you want to do with the band switch in the tightest position. Keep in mind you're sending messages to the truck. So it's going to e-coast 3 mile an hour beyond. Two mile an hour beyond, it's going to put on the jakes. If that doesn't hold it back, it's going to downshift with the jakes on. Because you're sending the truck a message, you can have a load on that's more than the jakes can hold back. If you put your foot on the brake, it will still hold it in that gear and the jakes will remain on. This is where the message becomes important. If you let your foot off the brake, the message you just sent the truck was all is clear ahead. The first thing it will do is release the jakes and it will keep it in the gear that, you're, that it was in. But if you continue in that mode, the last signal it got was from you, the driver, which is captain of the ship, is all's clear ahead. It's going to go after e-coast, and you're going to take off. There's two ways you can combat that. Either at that point pull the jake on manually, or simply just hit the resume button. But don't keep hitting the resume button with your foot still on the brake because like any other cruise control, you cannot set it with your foot on the brake pedal. So it really comes down to everything you're doing is a message. Um, in bad weather, if you do not want the truck to e-coast, by barely having your foot on the brake pedal, will, but not the brakes engaged, will not allow it to put it into e-coast, putting you into a situation, or you can lock it in manual mode. Either one of them will stop it from going into e-coast where you have to recover from the jake brakes and gives you a great opportunity to test out stability control, which is never the goal. 
Uh, going into IPM, which is Intelligent Powertrain Management. Once again, this is making decisions off of pure logic. It's reading with GPS. Jerry, is it a mile or two miles ahead? One mile? One mile ahead, it's reading ahead of you, kind of um, trying to figure out the terrain much like a roller coaster would. A lot of people like to talk about it as momentum management. I like to think about it as a good driver for fuel mileage that you're managing heat. You're trying to create as little heat to get from point A to point B, and that's what it is doing. And the first few drivers I had, they said, well, it led off at the wrong part of the hill. You got to almost to the top of the hill, and it rolled out of the throttle and put it into e-coast. And then it let it coast back up to speed instead of using the back side of the hill to regain your momentum. Then when it got up to their cruise speed, it put it back in gear. Well, the reason it put it back in gear to understand what's going on was so it could cut the fuel completely off of the engine because it takes a certain amount of fuel to idle the engine in Ecos. Then if it saw an area to pick up momentum, depending on where you had your CC band switch, it actually will regain the throttle up to three mile an hour faster than where you were if it picked up the momentum for free to make it up over the next hill. So really what you're doing is trying to get through from point A to point B using as little fuel or making as little heat as possible. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but understanding what it's going after makes it much easier to understand. Henry, real quick question. How do you know if you have IPM on your truck? When you have the crew set and it seems like it left off the throttle at the wrong time, that you'll know it real quick because that's the first thing I hear from a driver is, that it left off on the wrong part of the hill, usually followed by the fact that they do better on fuel than anybody else in the fleet with the older trucks, so, which usually leads to me responding, so I guess it didn't leave off at the wrong time, which makes very little difference in the time that you make at the end of the day. You know, people talk about when it's managing your momentum through the hills and, and these different specs of how does it pull on a hill, which always leads me to, when I look at the country, most of it's flat, and where it's not flat, the other half of it's downhill. So it's really a small percentage of your day that comes into climbing. And so, predictive acceleration. That's part of IPM. Yeah. Part, of, part of IPM. Take that, Jerry. I haven't witnessed the predictive acceleration part because I usually get up to speed well, on the throttle. Predictive acceleration would be as you're coming into a dip coasting is oh. if it sees I you know if the IPM sees that there's a hill coming, uh, it may throttle up. You know. Okay, I know what you're talking about there. What I found is at least on mine, it will never throttle up on flat ground because what what you what you gain by speed, you burn up way too much fuel to pick up speed with the truck. The only time I saw it do the Predictive acceleration is if it got the momentum for free off the backside of the previous hill. Yeah. So what it'll do is, on your, they changed how it says it now on mine. When you had the cruise set at 65, it would say cruise set 62 to 69. Which well, kind of the best way to think about it, Henry, is that when you were riding the bike when you were a kid, when you were coming down the hill and you were tooling up, and you know that you had to go up the next hill. Then you do your predictive acceleration, trying to get up the next step. Okay, which but I understood how it worked, you know, from that way. But yeah, it's very much like trying to get a bicycle up over the next hill. You're, you're building as much momentum as you can early, and it gets it for free off the backside of the last hill. So because I had some people get in it, they thought that it would ramp up on a flat ground. No, it won't do that because the amount of fuel it takes to pick yourself up three mile an hour to hit a hill and lose that three mile an hour instantaneously will not save you any fuel. Um, keep, keep in mind too, Henry, that with IPM you have ABA, so the radar knows there's nobody in front of you before it does the predictive acceleration. And that's something to know because on this, uh, how IPM works, one of the feedbacks that I gave to engineers for one, you need to ha know how to be polite to your fellow driver around you. And one of the feedbacks that I gave was it doesn't play well around others. So you have to know when you get to the top of a hill, if you have a whole bunch of trucks behind you that are on regular cruise control, 
and yours does that dip at the beginning, they're all going to dive out around you. You're going to get into what's referred to in NASCAR as their dirty air, which is going to cost you fuel. And then you're going to hit e-coast and be wanting to come back around them. You need to know when to override it to be polite, which is by lightly putting your foot on the throttle, we'll cancel it out. When you're by yourself, don't do it. And it happened to me once with it set at 55 coming out of Knoxville on I-75 to where the driver behind me said, would you make up what speed you want to go? Because he was on pure hard cruise and mine was fluctuating back and forth. So you need to know when to be polite amongst others. Because at this point, everybody doesn't have IPM yet. Uh, we got some things that we say not to do is, is to not rely on manual mode too much. What you learn is how to influence how it shifts through your foot feed, where you have the controls set. There's really very few times to ever use manual mode. Um, not to accelerate the truck trying to ramp up for a hill, and I learned this in an old truck. The person I wanted to run with all day had a much lower powered engine than I did. So he ran 65 and I ran 60, and we were in the mountains, and I had it in cruise. Every time I hit a hill, I was dead in the water. But when we got to the other end, it only took us 20 minutes longer all day, and I did a half mile to the gallon better. I said, well, there's something to this. Prior, I always used to do in because you didn't want to have to shift ramping it up ahead of time, and it didn't work. So don't do that part. Um, and learn that it's not an automatic. Learn how you're influencing it through your pedal feed, how GPS is reading on it, on the newer ones, how the terrain, everything is having an effect on how it's shifting. I wish I could illustrate it better here, but I learned up in Connecticut we were pulling out of the steep driveway that then made a turn to the left, which really kind of put up, set up a confusing set of situation for a transmission that's operating on pure logic. Because we were uphill, the tilt switch was tilted back. It tried to hold a gear. As soon as I made the left-hand turn, the cab tilted downhill, and the torque load dropped way off at the same time. And it went to upshift, but right about that point, you were pulling the trailer hard sideways on the tandems, which suddenly ran the torque load way up through the roof. And it made it all the way through it, but it was getting rapid fire different signals that it was trying to react to. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry and Wayne, and then we'll get into some questions. Um, Wayne, unless you have something, I think Henry's... Well, yeah, that's the thing to know. If you don't have the CC, I think it says limit switch on in the truck. I always want to call it band, but if you don't have that, your default is three... Well, it's three till it puts it in gear, five till it puts on the jig. Um, also know that if you have the CC band switch on, what they refer to as unlimited is only unlimited up to three mile an hour before it puts in gear, five till it puts on the jig over your maximum cruise speed. Sandy. I think from there we'll go ahead and open it up to any questions that you have. Uh, for either of these, uh, anyone. And to anyone, uh, so go ahead and uh, go ahead and ask away. <laughs> One at a time, preferably. I got a question. How how does the low ratio pull heavy loads? Uh, you know, as you see, more trucks are going with the lower uh, rear end rush ratio. Uh, how, how how does it pull heavy loads compared to, uh, you know, like the higher ratio? I'll take that one because I have the 400 with the 1750 foot-pound of torque all the way down to, uh, I think it comes in at like 975. 975. And, in fact, I found out it'll pull us pretty hard at 875 if you let it. The hardest thing is if you give it too much throttle when you're taking off and it takes it up to 1,600 RPM, there's no power up there. 
a lot of fleets are locking people out of what I refer to as the attic. I'd prefer them not to do that because once I show the driver nobody's up in the attic, there's no reason to go into the attic. All the power's in the basement. It, it pulls real good as long as you keep it under 1,275 RPMs. I found that my 228 with the 400 down sped, which is, it, it's weird to explain to a driver, but you have less horsepower and more horsepower all at the same time. Down at the RPMs where we're operating, it actually has more horsepower than we had before. Under 1,300 right. RPM has more horsepower. Where before all the horsepower was up in an RPM where we weren't operating and very far separated, separated from the torque. Now they're together at a much lower RPM. My 228 actually pulls the mountains of West Virginia with a heavy load better than my 250 rear axle ratio with a direct drive, which the 250 is equivalent to running a 342 with our common .73 overdrive. You can't tell the difference between those. So it's different to get used to because the engine doesn't make a sound like it's power pulling down them lower RPMs but it is um, just, as fat, just as quick or quicker than I was at the top of a hill as previous. The one thing you might notice is you get a quicker drop at the bottom of the hill until it gets into the torque range, and then it will pull stronger towards the middle and top of the hill. Yeah, that's what I just ran into with a fleet we were talking to. They had 241 gears, and yet they wanted to run... 73 mile an hour was it well it fell back eight mile an hour pretty hard because they were well above the 1275 and they're like but then when it got down a little slower it started pulling hard i said that's when i showed them the torque chart curve of the engine it got into where it really pulled so part of that study and and looking where the torque curves are on these new engines which is all online if you look up dd15 torque curves, you'll find quite a bit of it out there, and especially on the new downspeed engines, it really changed where those numbers are and how you gear a trip. Everything's, the DD15 to begin with was about 100 RPM below where we were using. Now when you go to the downspeed engines, we're another 100 RPM lower. I see you nodding your head, Wayne. You got in? For an 80,000 pound application, what we'd like to see is spec your trucks today with a GHG 17. Is between 1250 and 1350 cruising down the road. So whatever speed you want to run, we need to get as close to that band as we can. And, and people, when they want to gear their trucks, that's something I always talk about is shooting for average, looking at what your true average speed is and building around that. I see that this just happened with a fleet. They came in talking about specking their truck. They want to be able to run 75 mile an hour at 80,000 pounds, which was fine, but until we looked at it, the average speed of their trucks was seven miles per hour. They wanted to be able to do that for a half an hour a day to get to the next town. If we'd have built around that spec, they would have been, and it was an extreme case, but knowing where your true average speed is important, just like knowing where your true average weight is, is really important when you put these specs together instead of your maxes on everything. And what he's kind of referring to here is, when you go to spec a new truck with your dealer salesperson, um, what you need to do is make sure they understand your application and what you're doing with the truck. Um, they need to know your trailer, what kind of trailer you're using, what kind of aerodynamics you want, what your routes are, and what, sort of your daily normal habits. So it's real helpful for us to spec a truck for you to run our best fuel economy numbers. What's really helpful there is to get a copy of the engine report because the engine report will give you an objective view of what you're doing more than what you think you're doing. And don't ever spec more of the same, because things are changing every year. We may want to uh, make some changes to your current spec that you have this year or next year to make it more efficient. It, it's surprising how many drivers with an engine report that tell me they average 65 mile an hour. When I look at their engine report, they only average 53. Or 42. <laughs> or 42. <laughs> That's your average speed, and that's where you live. That's where you want the most fuel efficiency. Right. Fast. It's not just like the racetrack. It's right. whoever gets all the way around quickest. Right. Did that answer your question on the pulling? Well, yeah, we know it's uh, slow and steady. I guess uh, 
you know, that's definitely answering and uh, the way you spec in the trucks are changing. You know, I'm running an older truck, getting ready to, you know, in the next couple of years try to spec something new between, you know, Freightliner and even Volvo have some new stuff coming up. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate the help. This Anyone is Kelly. else with a question? Yeah, Kelly. Uh, Say hello yeah. to Linda. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Linda. Thank you for your help. Um, <laughs> actually, thank you everybody for your help. That's been that's been dealing with me. Uh, I'm I'm specking this truck right now for waiting for the downsped PD13, and I, I've been hearing a lot of stuff that I don't really know what it is that we're talking about, like a CC band switch. I, I'm, I'm assuming that would be the cruise control, but as, as, I, as I'm going through the process, I'm assuming that I'm going to have to be teaching the salesman some of these things since this is all brand new tech. The, the Dumpspet PD-13 is this month, you know, so uh, is, is there... He has a local TSR that can help him out, and you can ask him to contact the Detroit TSR in your region. What the TSR stands for? Technical Sales Representative from Detroit. Uh, actually, yes, and Henry did leave a message uh, that then your guys' conference started, so I've been leaving him alone. <laughs> <laughs> where, where are you? Uh, right, right here. I'm, I'm in Illinois, uh, so Illinois, Wisconsin area. We'll, we'll be ordering a truck in Wisconsin. Uh, one, one so thing I did. I, I, okay, one, one thing I, I heard was uh, 975 is the minimum for, for the, for the downsped motor. I, I don't know if it'll be the same. On the, on but where is it on the DD13, the new version? Same, same on the DD13. Because Kelly was asking me the other day about the DD13, and nothing much is out there to know too terribly much about that For myself. The, big, the biggest change with the GHD DD13 is finally we have the Generation Two fuel system in it, which gives us a two percent advantage over our GHD. Okay. I, as as much as I hate to ask, can you get closer to the speakerphone? <laughs> what I was saying is that with the GHG 17 DD13, yes. the biggest change that we made to it for this year is that it now has the new uh, second generation fuel system on it that we've had on uh, our DD15 now for over a year. Uh, what that does for you is it's going to give you an additional 2% fuel advantage over a GHG14 or last year's. Oh, beautiful. All right, so the the new fuel system is what's allowing you guys to downspeed the, the 13th? It's part of the package, yes. Part of the package, all right. Uh, so now if uh, if we've got a 300 RPM spread, uh, the the 975 was, was what I heard Henry say for, for the minimum, even though he's made it pull down to 875. And then the top end that you want to get the RPM to is 1275, so that's, that's 300 RPM. If I run 55 most of the time, and uh, we, we were just talking about not specking for the max, uh, every once in a while you get that load, it's hot, it's got to go, go, go. And how, how many, how long, how long until I start really losing fuel economy? If, if I spec a truck for 55, you know, is, is it 65, is it 70, 75, where, where do I start? really killing myself so, feel like that, man. you know that's something you got to measure as a daily decision and I have mine spec I sort of built most of my spec around 62 mile an hour and yet there's been days where I've had to make time and run 75 all day and still turn respectable fuel mileage just know that where your peak is is where your peak is. Uh, ever, you know, it makes a big difference when you start trying to run faster if it happens to be into a headwind. It makes an even bigger difference if it happens to be a headwind and it's cold. 
And it even makes a big difference if it's a headwind and it's cold and it's a monsoon and you're heading uphill. So, you know, it's it's something you got to calculate in. How important is it to make that hot load happen that day? And usually if it's that hot and paying that good, you can't make up the difference in fuel mileage. If you're not going to get there, I always bring up the example if it's a Friday and running fairly hot all day is going to get you unloaded and reloaded and be at a runner with weekend versus the truck sitting all weekend, you can't make up that in fuel mileage. It's time to go. So right. I've done Okay. Okay, maybe, 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 maybe I asked it a little bit off. Well, I, I think I understood the question a little bit better. I think basically once you get above what you expect for, you're going to stop losing fuel mileage immediately. And the question becomes how much fuel mileage. It used to be the old measuring stick was – a tenth of a mile per gallon per mile an hour. But I think with the new aerodynamics, it's probably close to the six or seven hundredths of a mile per gallon for every mile an hour you go faster. Then you got to do what you got to do. And whenever you go over what it's spec for, you're going to lose fuel mileage. But that's more of a general idea. It depends on the aerodynamics of the rocket trailer as well. And Kelly, when you get a hold of your technical <clears throat> sales rep from Detroit, he can yes. build you a model. We have a we have a program where we can build you a model, show you several, several different fuel ratios, and we truck will be running at the speed you want to perform at. Give you something to look at and discuss with you. And run some simulations of routes that we run and speed. And, and the thing to know about speed is that the bell curves. Each mile an hour, the increase is worse than the one behind it. The way air resistance works. So. It ramps up to where you get up to speeds like race cars do of 200 mile an hour. A piece of duct tape starts affecting you. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, I I just heard you know the the DD15 is is much more forgiving than than my 12.7 that I'm running now, and it's you know you, you keep your fuel economy in a in a wide wider band. So I'm, I'm just trying to. Trying to you see. got two things working working for you that way, aerodynamics and the engines. The aerodynamics have gotten better, so, I mean, that's a little cliche, but that's what I always said in our industry. I can't understand why anybody would want to fight with the air. We have enough battles to fight in this industry with insurance and regulations and everything else. No need fighting with the air. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Switching gears, if I may, the intelligent powertrain management, uh, where where it links to the GPS, uh, is is that is that very new technology? I actually had a salesman tell me, no way do you want that thing that's linked to the GPS. That's that's crap, and you don't want it. It's not ready yet. He needs to retire. <laughs> that's probably one of okay. the greatest advantages we have with our Detroit engines today, is is IPM. And if you want to really go back to old school, um, this person needs to understand the old terminology was predictive cruise. Um, It works much in that same manner. But IPM, if if you're wanting top fuel economy, it is absolutely the best thing you can have. Okay. And that that could could, could only be ordered with APA. No, it's it's standard with it's standard with all DT12 transmissions. If you don't want it, you can you can uh, omit it, but I don't recommend that. Okay, yeah, because that, that, that sounds it. great to me. That, that sounds absolutely great to me because I I love going slow. I love being very less stressed than all the other guys <laughs> flying past me. So, uh, thank you for your time, and I'll put myself back on mute. Let this uh, let somebody else get in here. Thank you. Thanks. Great question. Anyone else got anything? I think there's some people on there that just got a DT12. I think I know of one by the numbers. You on there? <laughs> Yeah, I've got a question. You talk about inputs for uh, 
driver input, garbage in, garbage out on the whole thing, when are you going to put a gauge that says what we're doing for percentage of throttle? So we've got an exact rating versus what our toes might be telling us. Be like a load factor? <laughs> or like how much did that You mean to like? watch where your throttle position is? Almost like you can watch the fuel mileage on the readout up on the dash? Uh, yeah, I want to know how much pressure I put on the throttle, where I am, so I know what I'm, I'm actually telling the truck versus what I think I'm telling the truck. Well, you can tell a little bit by how it's upshifting. You can also tell by that fuel use gauge that's there. And I think if we put many more things to look for, we're going to have to make a quicker rush towards autonomous because you won't be looking at the windshield. Well, but I think I thought, look at your turbo boost gauge, too. Yeah. You start watching the turbo boost gauge up going up, and it will give you a pretty good idea of what you're doing. Also, if you have uh, Qualcomm, there's a screen in the, on the Qualcomm that tells you know, the percentage of the, the throttle position. Okay. Is that right? That's, we, we use our turbo boost gauge, and I try to keep it as close to zero as possible. And we do pretty good on fuel. We get like 12 with yours, don't we? On the caller that we're talking to right now, um, when we were talking about the low end and pulling, I know that you probably can add something to this because I know you test drove one that was loaded around Louisville, and I kept locking it in manual and putting it at a real low RPM and showing how to pull up out of it. I think you can probably help that other person we were talking out quite a bit from your experience. Um, yeah, when... If you hadn't opened the doors on that trailer and showed that you had concrete packed in there, I would have thought it was an empty trailer. There's plenty of pull with that combination. I think we got a few more questions coming in. I, I thought of one. Uh, that we often hear is, and Henry, you're going to have to answer this one because you get it easier, is my my truck won't coast anymore. What's wrong with mine? Oh, yes. Well, you, and you forget about this when you've been driving them a while. So your e-coast, which anytime it's an e-coast, if you hit your foot or on the brake or the throttle, it instantly goes back into gear like it was never out of gear. But a lot of people, especially they're really – running after fuel mileage that own their own truck, they're like, something's broke on my truck, it won't e-coast. No, it's not broke, and it will usually take about two hours and 45 minutes to come back. It's because you're in the middle of a passive regen. And because the engine needs to make heat to make that work, instead of putting cool exhaust and trying to cool off a DPF that you're trying to heat, they keep it in gear during the whole time period. What I like to tell people that are going after maximum efficiency on that, I can pretty much predict when mine are going to come in because Linda that just asked that, she'll be talking to me, and I'm like, well, I think I'm going to be on a regen soon, and about 20 minutes later I am just because I know it comes about every 1,400 miles. But that being said, if you're doing a regen, the most efficient way is to drive all the way through it with it hot. So as soon as mine stops e-coasting, if I was planning on taking a break or taking a shower or eating or doing any of that stuff I, or fueling, I take care of all that right then so that I can drive through it in one swell shot if, if possible. That being said, I don't drive around an extra two hours past my customer to make sure I completed it. It will pick up where it left off. That's a, that's a great point because... If you let it complete your pass and regen, then you're not doing a park regen later on, and, and that's that's just wasted fuel. Uh, as far as fuel mileage. Yeah, I've got 235,000 miles in my truck. It's done two park regens, and that was one because the TSR told me he wanted me to do it, and the other one was uh, <laughs> <laughs> that technical sales rep, and then the other one was just because it was brand new and one of the somebody else wanted to see it, so we did it. But other than that, it's never had to do a Park regen. Yeah, I've I've never had to do one in close to 800,000 miles with DD15s. As, as long as you don't idle, 
The thing everybody needs to understand with regens and making them more efficient, and making this is off the transmission side, but making your um, after treatment devices last longer is every moment, and don't quote me on the number, but one of you might know the number, that it's below 270 degrees centigrade, I think is the number. It's starting the timer towards one of the major factors towards starting the timer of when your next regen. I don't know whether it's 270 degrees centigrade. That doesn't matter. What the thing to know is every moment that it's below a th certain threshold is one of the major contributors towards setting off when it's going to do its next regen. So when you have somebody that idles the truck all weekend and they say, and then I had to sit 45 minutes and do a regen, well, it's because of what you did to the truck at that point. You were running cool exhaust through that DPF all weekend, which then puts you in, especially if it's in the winter time. So like in my case, my idle time is usually between 3 and 5%. That DPF is not being run around cold as often as someone else's is, leading you to do more parked regions, which I've never had to do one either. I don't think there's anybody in here that's had to do one. Even on the local stuff, I never had to do one. We did one on our last truck, but it was because we were <laughs> stuck on a freeway in an ice storm in <laughs> like 20 hours. And in the case of you move forward 100 yards stop and move forward 100 yards and stop, and it was cold out, so you want to shut the truck off and be starting this every two or three minutes. So we basically sat there and idled for about 20 hours, and when we finally did get rolling, we didn't build enough heat fast enough, and it, it actually, we got the lights that said, we, you need to pull over and do a regen, so we did. But it only took like 18 minutes, and we were back on the road. A big deal. It gave you plenty of warning before you had to do it too, didn't it? Yeah, and That's what I remember on the story. We actually had a load of explosives, so finding a safe place to pull over <laughs> was a challenge because of all the other trucks that were on the road and running back roads through Arkansas and, and just finding a, a good safe place to do that regen was one of our biggest challenges on that one. Yeah, we'll talk about the resources. I didn't mention that. Yeah, there's quite a few, I want to call them knowledge videos that if you go to YouTube and you start looking up Detroit DT-12 and you'll find a plethora of instructional videos to help maximize investment made in such a transmission and to understand not just that but on the engine and everything in general, whether you're driving a manual or the automated manual knowing where the torque curves of your engine, which is to me way more important than understanding where the horsepower is, because horsepower is simply the measurement of how quickly the engine will accelerate. Torque's what gets you up over that hill. And knowing where that is and knowing how to stay in that power band will greatly increase your satisfaction with it, the equipment. So going to YouTube, there's you start Googling up Detroit DT12 and you'll you'll find videos to entertain you for many hours. And a quick uh, uh, tip for everybody out there, um, we also, Freightliner also offers a free app uh, for iPhones and Android devices. It's called the Smart Source, and you can download that. Like I said, it is for free, and we have all, a lot of uh, videos on there, as well as uh, brochures. If you're not sure about something, there's brochures on there, and a, it's a nice resource guide for everybody out there, and we'll be adding more videos to it in the future. Um, or like Henry said, you can go to YouTube and, and check out all the uh, videos we offer out there. All right, we'll wrap up, I guess. Did anybody talk about the Jake break uh, usage yet? Uh, I called in late because I couldn't get to the phone. No, not really, because we were trying to cover a lot of things quickly at the beginning. So the Jake break on this transmission set up, a, well, actually quite a bit different where before we used to pull the jake to all the way to the third stage and downshift our way down through them. This transmission maximizes each stage of your jake as you pull it on. And in fact, it reacts differently 
if you pull it through each stage individually than if you pull it on all the way to the third stage all at once. If you rip it all the way into the third stage, the message you sent to the truck was, was you were having a oh my God moment and it reacts in that manner. It goes after all, I think it's 580 available braking horsepower at that point, and puts the RPMs up about 2200 and, and drops two gears and gets you kind of excited. So what we like to refer to is don't do that. But we very seldom use it that way. The, other, the only time I pretty much use my jakes and knowing that every time you put the jakes on cancels out your cruise control. If you didn't put your foot on the brake, when you take the jig switch back off, it will resume to your previous speed. Kind of important to know if you just pull it on trimming up for traffic a little bit and you swing it off because if you have the cruise set at 65 or 70, it will regain acceleration at that point. Um, we went down through how to use the cruise control or descent control for going down a hill. Um, my easiest method is to set the cruise five mile an hour below the speed I want to be at, have the CC band switch in the tightest position, which at five over puts the jakes on or will downshift if it continues to accelerate. Know that if you get a load that's too much for it to hold back, if you put your foot on the brake, it'll continue all those actions till you take your foot off the brake because at that point the message you sent is all's clear ahead and it's going to respond in that fashion. At that point, either take your foot off the brake after you get it slowed down and hit resume or pull the jake on manually. Uh, there's some people that like to get down a hill in manual mode and run the jake the old-fashioned way of figuring all that out, but once you learn the other way, it actually ends up being less work, and at the bottom of the hill, you can just trim your speed back up and resume to the speed you wanted to anyway. Did that answer that for you? I went through that kind of quick. Yeah, well, I've had, I've had the truck for 60,000 miles now, and that's pretty much what I figured out. But uh, uh, the problem I'm having is uh, I have to lock my elbow into the armrest and my thumb into the steering wheel uh, in order to operate the, uh, the paddle because when you're floating in your seat, sometimes you wind up ripping to the third uh, position or uh, bumping <laughs> up and down by accident. Yes, I agree with that. I made that that they need a little bit more positive detent between those positions, so I second your sentiment on that. Or ne not necessarily have the uh, the jake on that paddle. I like the jake yeah. on the paddle. I got used to mine there, but I can understand. <clears throat> going forward, the jake is going to be on that paddle whether you have a DT-12 or not. Is that's, that right? That's the oh, standard boy. position for jake brake on manual or automated. Yeah, that's what you do. Just go. You go from like one one speed to the third speed, Jake. They're most powerful. And sometimes if you hit a bump right when you're doing yeah. it, it you yeah yeah it'll. I haven't really had that issue. I've done that already, but not so often after the first time. Yeah. So so that third position, in my opinion, though, is is really rough. I mean, I. I, I don't like it. I try not to hit it. Uh, the first position does just about everything you need. Yeah, yeah. Well, that third position is what we like to refer to as, well, we won't Stop use it. that language, <laughs> no. but, but, but it's, it, that's, you know, drag your foot, throw out the anchor, grab everything you got to be helping out. I very seldom go to the second position. I yeah. mean, I, I, well, I run upper Midwest. It's not a lot of big hills, but we've been doing some Georgia coming down Mount Eagle. I've never had to go beyond the first position. I've played with it a couple times where I've gone down and just used the jakes to, to hold my speed coming down there. But mostly I'll just use the brake of the jake in and, and it, and the first gear and I've never really had a problem with it. But I'm not hitting the big, you know, West Donner Pass or anything. No, the two biggest ones I do regular are Black Mountain in the North Carolina and Fancy Gap. And I'm usually pretty heavy when I'm coming back across there and Usually if I just set the cruise five under the speed I want with the band switch at the tightest position, it'll pick the right amount of gear all the way down the hill, which kind of brings us into an important thing. If it's snowing out, you shouldn't be using the jakes anyway. And, and I always tell everybody, if you set that up automatically and the hill happens to be icy, you have the potential of activating 580 braking horsepower, which gives you a fine opportunity to test out stability control that's built into the truck, which... I would prefer that you don't test because I don't want to test it either. 
It works, though. It works, but it, it's one of them things that you prefer. It's kind of like having an airplane with a parachute. You prefer not to have to use it. Is there a way to shut the truck down in gear to do a uh, pump-down test on the brakes? Does anyone know, as opposed to just chalk, chalking the wheels? Oh, I know what he's talking about. So when you're doing an inspection, if you don't have wheel chocks, what you used to do is put the truck like in a low reverse or forward, and you, with the engine off, pump the brakes down, but there's no way yes. to leave this transmission. In gear, no. Uh, if you if you stop your truck and set the park brake and leave the transmission in gear, the transmission automatically goes to neutral. No. It won't let you shut the truck off with it in gear. <coughs> Protect itself. Right. So so there's no way to do that at all. Yeah, you'll okay. need to carry your shocks with you. Okay. Or or do it one at a time. You could if you're hooked to a trailer, you could leave the trailer brakes on to hold it still and do the other one. If you got the hands out. And then, well, if you just left the trailer oh, brakes so on, trailer push in the tractor, and you could do them individually if you wanted to to pump it down. Which brings up a subject. People are doing that a lot, seems to be, when I'm sleeping right next to my sleeper. They're doing their pump-down test. I really enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> At least they're doing it. Yes, I can't fault them for doing a pre-trip, but I've been having more people decide to pump their brakes down about six hours into my sleep. <laughs> that was a good question. Got another question for you here. Um, we uh, have noticed we've uh, been on our truck since uh, November 30th of last year. We've got about uh, 54,000 on it. But uh, on cruise control, you know, you come down a hill, it holds you. Um, it holds you back and stuff, but when it rolls back in going up the hill, it drops. Our our truck seems to drop about uh, oh, about three to four miles an hour underneath uh, what our cruise control is set to, and then it really, you know, it even downshifts and then go up back up the hill, which to me it seems like they don't, it, it doesn't roll back into the throttle like if you were doing the throttle manually. What your model was your truck, and it sounds like you have soft cruise enabled on it. Which it, I always had soft cruise enabled. It's uh, it's a 16. Soft cruise is enabled on it. So what that does is, you know, when I'm really going after fuel mileage back in the day when I'd be doing it all manually, when you hit a hill, if you lost two, three mile an hour, which really wasn't going to be the end of the day, losing two, three mile an hour versus getting excited where it throws the kitchen sink at it as soon as it loses a mile an hour, cost a lot of fuel, which changes your time very little. So it's trying to mimic what you would do in that. Uh, Wayne, is there, if, if a person really didn't like it, is there a way to shut off soft? You can disable soft cruise. And what you're feeling is when soft cruise is, cruise is disabled, when you start back into your pull with cruise control on, it could go up to as much as 90 or 100 percent throttle without soft cruise. With soft cruise, it's just a gradual fueling of the engine instead of from zero to 90. So it might go 40%, 60%, 80% until you get back up to your road speed. And I think that's what you're experiencing. Okay. So you recommended leave on the soft cruise and we just kind of, kind of live with this because we're trying to do our best fuel mileage, of course. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. mess with it. You want well, just, best, if, best fuel mileage, leave it on. Yeah. Well, just if, if it's, if it's a situation, just override it by using the fuel pedal. Yeah. That's all you okay. got to do is lightly touch the fuel throttle and it puts you back to, and you don't have to shove into it if you barely put your foot on the throttle. Remember, too, it's getting down to the torque curve if you're coming up a hill. So it's trying to get into this high torque. Yeah, because we really notice that we're out west now. We're out in California. So we really notice that sometimes uh, it, it even drops sometimes six, seven miles an hour before it actually gets into it. So we actually have to come over and touch, touch it, and it actually then downshifts. To, to start rolling some of the some of the hills out here. Yeah. What what speed are you operating? What gear ratio do you have? Uh, gear ratio, gear ratio, gear ratio. Um, uh, is, shoot, it, um, is it direct drive? Um, yeah, we're we're. 
um, truck is much set you up like the, the. I'm sorry. It would be prettier than the inside of your glove box if you don't know. Yeah, you know, hang on a second. <laughs> you're not driving while you're in, going into the glove box, sorry. <laughs> No, it, there'll be a sticker inside your glove box, and it'll tell you a lot of different. It'll tell you yeah, your axle. It'll tell you. Yeah, two ninety three is the rear axle. Okay, so it's an overdrive. 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 Yeah. That isn't what I have, so those numbers don't just rattle off my head. But if, what what speed are you cruising at when you're at? We 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 run it in California. Run about fifty seven miles an hour. Okay. And what RPM are you at that point? Uh, a little over 1,100. So it's like that should be working out real good with the, if you've got the downsped, if he has the old engine, not so much, but if you have the downsped 400, I know on mine I found out that 55 to 57, it gets incredibly happy. DD13 or DD15? DD13 or DD13? 13. 13. 13. 13. 13. This, is, this is like a Caffey truck. This is a straight truck. Oh. Okay, well, Bob, you take that. I'm in tractor trailer land. We're, we're out here with the big trucks. This is, this is Stephen and Cindy. We figured that out. Okay. Okay. It's designed to do. But we just, we just yeah. that it, it doesn't roll into the throttle that we you're accustomed to when you're, like, driving a vehicle, a car. Right. It seems right. to have a little bit of lag, and it drops too much, too much of the – to us, too many miles an hour, and then it actually then downshifts to go up the hill. That's because you're operating right next to a shift point. So when you're when you're right next to a shift point, it makes it very difficult because he would be sitting pretty close to a shift point, wouldn't he, Wayne, with that 293 and yeah. running at that speed? Of what point does it shift down to 11? You're like about 50 miles an hour. Uh, about yeah, 50, 51. Yeah, that's what it's doing. You're, you're just that. so close to a. You know, okay. it might be interesting on yours with that because you're so close to a shift point just to try it for a little bit with the soft off because it may not let it droop to hit the shift point. Oh, I, I wouldn't even go that far. I would just override it. If, you, if it gets down, if, you, if you're running at 57, when it gets down to 53, no, give the, it a little throttle. Yeah, just, just tow into it and see if that eliminates it. That way you wouldn't have to actually pay somebody to shut it off or turn it on. Okay. And see if it still downshifts if you barely tow it beforehand. And if you're operating a lot at that speed, you might be one of those rare, rare cases that soft cruise being, it's letting them droop into there where it's downshifting every time. It, it's not often you would say shut off soft cruise. To, uh, yeah, but, I, I, I still think just... What, what speed do you normally run at, Stephen, when you're not in California? 62 miles an hour, Bob. And we've kind, of, we've kind of noticed the same thing when we're running the 62 miles an hour also on any of the hills, that it doesn't seem to roll into it as fast as we would prefer it to roll into it. And um, typically at 62, it doesn't downshift, but it, it, it actually will get down to about 56 miles an hour going back up the hill. But it doesn't downshift. Here in California, it downshifts, but um, anywhere else that we can run a decent speed, that the you know the speed limit is set higher than 55. So when you when you're running 62 and it drops to 55, it's not downshifting. No, 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 it does not. It does not downshift, but it, it still seems like to us right. it really it, it 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 doesn't roll into the throttle uh, fast enough, like for us to yeah. to, to main, maintain that speed because a lot of times you end up with someone behind you. You have another truck that's behind you. They jump out and pass, and then going up the hill, all of a sudden they lose their speed, and you gain their. You, you play play that tag game yeah. back and forth. Interesting on that so, particular case. What do you think, Wayne? Yep. Because what what that soft cruise is trying to do is act like you have an egg between your a raw egg between your foot and the throttle, and yeah. so to speak, that's a, like a virtual egg between the cruise control and your throttle, as it may be, and that's. Probably the very few times that I ever would have thought to maybe try it without it, because he's so close. What are you thinking, Wayne? Sure. I I, yes, but I think I'd first try overriding it myself. Yeah. Just because, yeah. you know, that's where, 
Yeah, people don't think that the driver has a lot of control over it. The driver does have a lot of control over it. And just doing that would uh, kind of eliminate the soft cruise. And, and if you find after trying it that, that it really does do better overriding it, then, then look at your option of shutting it off. But, but, but watch your fuel mileage at the same time you're overriding it, see if that affects your fuel mileage. Right. And what we've been doing is he can well, with lock and manual in when he's in high gear. True. Because he's light and it's a straight well, truck I mean, with a DD-13. Even out of manual in auto mode, you still have the option to paddle shift up and down, and, and it will accept the shift until it decides that, okay, now you don't need to be here, and it'll shift itself back. But you still have the option to paddle shift up and down, even in auto mode. No way it would hold it there. Well, you know, like if he's in California and knows he's going to be right around that point, just paddle shift knock the lock, lock down, he could just... Well, he could just paddle shift down, and if it likes that gear pull in the next hill, it'll just stay there. Okay. Yeah, because what we've been what we've been doing is we've been experimenting with it, where Sandy will actually uh, throttle it, you know, going up the hill, and I'll just leave it alone to see what it would what it does. So we've been we've been experimenting ourselves with it to, to figure out what works best for us. Right. And you're in a fairly unique operation. That, yeah. Yeah, it's a little different than than long haul, you know, that we normally see. Long haul tractor trailer, which they're long haul but straight truck, right? Creates different demands. Yes. Good question. All right. Well, I Ooh. think we're going to wrap this up for today. If uh, anyone has any additional questions, you can uh, feel free to email us at admin at teamrunsmart.com. And if you joined us late, we will have a recording of uh, the call up on teamrunsmart.com. Uh, within the next week. So thank you for calling in.